Right, welcome back. And in this section, let's look at the presuppositions of NLP. Now, the presuppositions of NLP are simply convenient beliefs or assumptions. They things that and beliefs that we adopt about our client. They're not necessarily true, but they certainly filter our perceptions about our clients. So by adopting certain beliefs, we can increase our results with NLP. So they aren't strictly true, but they certainly make a change in how we work with our clients. Now we've given you a mnemonic device, respect your world. And this is a nice easy way to remember these 14 presuppositions. So the first is respect for the other person's model of the world. And so that doesn't mean that we accept what they're doing or that we don't change it. It simply means that we respect it and then enter into it. So if the client comes to you and says something, you know, it sounds really crazy. If you say to the client, hey man, you sound really crazy. Well, that probably is not going to be the best way to approach it. Now, that's certainly not going to help you build rapport with your client or build trust with a client. So the best way to approach is, is actually to accept what it is that they're saying. We work from in their model of the world to help create the change that they want. The second, behavior and change are to be evaluated in terms of context and ecology. Well, in general, we want to evaluate anything that happens, whatever the client gives us, we want to evaluate that in terms of the context that it occurs in. And what that means is what's going on around the client and as well as the ecology. So what is it that the client is asking us to achieve? So for example, if the client says to you, you know what, I want more energy all of the time. Do you think that might be appropriate? Possibly not. Because you know, at three o'clock in the morning, we should be sleeping. And having loads of energy at three o'clock in the morning and not sleeping is going to negatively affect the client down the line. So it's important to consider the ecology. So what will be the impact on the client, on their family, on society, and ultimately the planet if this change actually happens. And we need to consider that within context. The next presupposition is resistance in a client is a sign of lack of rapport. There are no resistant clients, only inflexible communicators. And effective communicators accept and utilize all communication presented to them. So we want to create a safe space for our client where they can feel comfortable and free of judgment so that they're able to talk. Building rapport will actually give us that. When we find that maybe there's a situation where that is not happening, there's this trust is not there, or we're not able to communicate effectively, then probably there's not rapport. And we're actually going to look at how do we build rapport later on. The next presupposition is people are not their behaviors. So we want to accept the person and we want to change the behavior. You see, this is very important because what it allows us to accept is the person and change the behavior. Because you are not your behavior. See everybody as magnificent and help them in actualizing that magnificence. You see, you clearly more than your behavior. In fact, whatever behavior you think that you are, you know that you are more than that, don't you? You know, if you ask people on the street, who are you? A lot of them are actually going to tell you what their behavior is. They'll say, I'm a lawyer, I'm an artist, I'm a banker, I'm a housewife, I'm a hypnotherapist. But that simply is just the behavior. You see, it's not who you are per se. Similarly, think of a child that does something naughty. The, so the child screws up. We don't say the child is a screw up. We separate the child from the behavior. And we say, okay, you know what? That particular behavior was not what we're looking for. So how do we change that behavior? Accepting the person and changing the behavior. The next presupposition Everybody is doing the best that they can with the resources they have available. And every behavior is geared for adaption. And the present behavior 
is the best choice available. So every behavior is motivated behind a positive intent. You know, even when it's not positive for us, the person who's doing that behavior is doing it because they have an intention to do or to achieve something. However, it may not be po uh, positive for the person to whom that's being done. This also means that you can forgive other people and forgive yourself. So this is like the NLP equivalent of forgiveness. Because we're only doing the best that we can with the resources that we have available. Then number six, we want to calibrate on behavior. The most important information about a person is that person's behavior. People are very easy to pay lip service. It's very easy to say I want to do something, but not to do it. So people say one thing and do something totally different. And we want to calibrate on the behavior, on what they're actually doing. So next we've got the map is not the territory. The words we use are not the event or the item that they represent. Everyone has a different meaning for a certain word. If I was to talk about what the word picnic means, and we do this during the training, then that means something totally different for each person. If I asked 15 people, what does the word picnic mean? And what's the first thing that comes up when you think of the word picnic? You can get 15 different answers. Remember that as we take information in, we delete, we generalize, and we distort based on our own internal filters. And so we create our own internal representation. And so if we then go ahead and we use language to try and describe a particular thing, we're only doing that from within inside our own neurology. And so that word that we're using isn't the map at all. It's simply a description we're giving. But it can never totally represent the experience itself. And so each of us will have a different words that we use within our structure or our thinking. And so that's what the map is not the territory means. So for my clients, I'm going to use words that produce the most results in them and those words may not be the same words that I would use for another client or even for myself. Next one, you're in charge of your mind and therefore your results. I'm also in charge of my mind and therefore my results. What this means is that if I can structure my thinking so that I hold a positive outcome, a positive representation in my mind, if I can totally focus on what I want to have happen, then I can produce those kind of results. We all as human beings are in charge of our own state. Everything we do is dependent on that internal representation and that state and that physiology that we discussed during the communication model. So who's driving your bus? We are in charge of our own thinking and therefore in charge of the results that we produce. To say that you have no choice over your thoughts, well, that excludes the whole function of conscious mind thinking. Because the fact is, if I said think of a blue tree, you can choose to think of a blue tree or you can choose not to think of a blue tree. If there's lousy thoughts in my mind, then I'm in charge of them. The fact is, we're in charge of our mind and therefore in charge of the kind of results that we produce through our thinking. And of course, that's what we discussed during the NLP communication model. Next, we've got... People have all the resources they need to succeed and to achieve the desired outcomes. So there's no unresourceful people, only unresourceful states. People have the ability to succeed. And there's no unresourceful people, just unresourceful states. See, we have the ability to succeed. And we have all the resources that we need. It just means that we have... Sometimes we need to get in touch with those resources. Or sometimes we might need to learn a, a few additional skills. All that we need to do is either to add the resources necessary or to allow them to be able to get rid of whatever prevents them from not being able to achieve it. And that's a really useful belief to have. It means that there's no limitation in regards to what a person can achieve or what a person can even learn. You see, we are learning machines. It might just be that the person is using a unuseful learning strategy. You see, everybody has the ability to learn. 
if we were to take a rat and put a rat in an enriched environment, then in 45 minutes that rat's brain would actually, the weight would change, it would become heavier. So enriched environment simply means an environment where the rat would need to learn something. Now as a human brain, that will change in moments. And so when they cut open Einstein's brain, they looked at it and they said, oh, but you know, this guy's brain is, is heavier. He had so much gray matter that his brain is heavier than the normal person. So the question is, was Einstein's brain heavier and that allowed him to think the thoughts that he did? Or was it because of the thoughts that he was thinking that his brain was heavier? In NLP, of course, we believe that the brain is used and the use of the brain will increase the brain weight. So we believe that people have all the resources that they need to succeed and to produce the kind of results that they want to produce and get the outcomes that they want. Number 10, all procedures should increase wholeness. So if we're going to do any kind of intervention, then that needs to create wholeness. Because we already think, you know, people already are too fragmented. Look at parts integration as an example, where we have this internal conflict. On the one hand, I want to do this. On the other hand, I want to do that. And so with this conflict, it, it draws energy. And people already have so much internal conflict. So what we want to do is we want to increase wholeness. Because, of course, wholeness is much better than fragmentation. Next, we've got there's only feedback. There's no failure. So we should always welcome feedback. Because it's what's going to allow us to improve our behavior and get better and better. So if something's not working, don't see it as failure. See it as an opportunity to learn. If everything that happens is only feedback and we are a learning machine, then I'm going to improve my behavior so I can create the kind of results that I want. If you're communicating with somebody and you're not getting the response that you want, what do you do? Change your communication. So there's no failure, only feedback. And speaking of communication, the meaning of your communication is the response that you get. So when you're communicating with somebody and they're communicating with you, how much of that communication do you think you're responsible for? If you say you're only responsible for 50% of your communication, you're leaving 50% of that communication on the table. And this is where very often people can have misunderstandings. So it's really important to take 100% responsibility for that communication to create the results that we want. Have you ever heard people having a conversation and maybe one person doesn't understand and then the other person starts to speak even louder, <laughs> you know, saying the same thing? And it's almost as if they think that by speaking louder that suddenly that's going to help the other person understand. And of course, we know that that doesn't. So accept the feedback. Look at how you can change your communication. William James said around 1890, he said, The great discovery of our age will be that a person can change his thinking inside of himself and therefore change the world around him. So the question is, how do you make a change inside of yourself so that it can make a difference in the relationship outside of you? How would you be able to change inside of you? What kind of things could you change inside of you so that you could make a change that would reflect in people around you or outside of you? If the communication that you're communicating isn't getting a response that you want, then change that communication. If you had unlimited choice of behaviors, and all the time to think about it, then I'm pretty sure you'd be able to get the response that you want. In fact, that's one of the things that we discuss in mindfulness. You see, very often people are reacting to things that are going on rather than responding. And so taking that time and thinking, well, how do I need to communicate differently? And then giving a response that's adequate as opposed to reacting, example, shouting or starting to speak louder. The next presupposition is the law of requisite variety. 
So the system or the person with the most flexibility of behavior will control the system. And again, you know, if we just consider what we said with the meaning of communications response that you get, if something is not working, do it in a different way. It's really important to have that kind of flexibility that will allow you to be able to respond to the client's needs and change the client in terms of producing the kind of results that the client wants. In fact, Milton Erickson, he said that his best hypnosis subject became his best subject after 300 repeated inductions. I mean, can you imagine that? 300 repeated inductions? That is a lot of variety, a lot of different ways of doing something. Well, if we strive to have greater flexibility, then our results will get better. Just think about it. Who do you think are the most flexible people on earth? Of course, our kids. Why? Well, they can create such a range of behaviors. I don't know if you've ever noticed you go into the shops and maybe a child doesn't get what they want and you see these parents with the children and the child is either screaming or crying or laying on the floor and throwing a tantrum. You know, they've got so many different ways of doing. They ask mommy and then they would ask daddy and then they'd ask mommy and then they start crying. And then they say, but you don't love me. <laughs> so they've got so many different ways of, of doing something. So law of requisite variety is about learning a range of behaviors so that we can be adaptable to get what we want. Then lastly, all procedures should be designed to increase choice. And this just means that if a client comes to you and wants to change something, then we don't want to limit their behavior. We want to do something where the client has extra choice, a choice of doing something differently. We want to give them additional skills and additional options. And we'll talk more about that. So that's the presuppositions of NLP. In the next section, we will talk about some of the prime directives of the unconscious mind.